Well, I, I will get started then. Mr. Curtis, is that the plan? I will yeah. just launch? Okay, thank you. Our board members are all assembled in the, in the room here and we're ready for the presentation. Thank okay, you. wonderful. Well, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me to join you tonight. Um, I appreciate the invitation. I always like to talk to folks, so this is great. Um, I, do, I do have a presentation that I think will help guide the discussion. I've taken a look at the questions that, that you had sent through Mr. Curtis, and I think a lot of them will be addressed as we go through this, but um, please feel free to jump in and ask questions as we go. It's usually better to ask them when we're at that point in the, um, in the presentation. So um, this is just our, our standard reminder uh, that we are about academics, the whole child, and our educators. Those are the three main areas of focus for the uh, Department of Education and the work of the Finance and Operations Department is really the kind of the foundational work for all of that. We support all of those areas and all of our school districts and all of our schools in all of the work that you do. Um, just going to give a, a two second run through where education funding has been. We'll talk about the formula, take a look at the allocation sheet and all the good information that's there. Um, then there's a couple of other topics uh, that like maintenance of effort that I'd like to touch on um, and I'll leave you with some resources and there's always time for questions. That's the best, the best part. Um, going back to 1977, uh, I was in Massachusetts then, but the Tennessee Foundation Program was the funding formula. Uh, it was challenged in the late 80s uh, and there was a study of the program and it was found to be uh, really not adequate for uh, funding education in Tennessee. In the late 80s, small systems lawsuits, uh, there were three of those. And uh, the Supreme Court ended up, uh, uh, Tennessee Supreme Court ordered the state to find a new funding formula. And so from that, the basic education or program or BEP was formed. A um, couple of things to note, it is not a spending plan, it's a funding formula. It generates funding dollars for districts. How those dollars are spent is in large part up to the local school board. Um, there were 45 components at the outset, there are 46 now. Um, it is a very basic formula. It certainly doesn't include everything that you want or need for your students but it, is, it does provide uh, basic funding for basic educational components. Education funding in Tennessee is meant to be a shared responsibility. And so it is meant to be shared between the state and the local uh, governmental entity. So in your case, it is between the state and Cannon County uh, Commission are the two entities who, who need to work together to fund education uh, for Cannon County students. The BEP was modified in 2007, uh, BEP 2.0, you hear about that, uh, people just still talk about that. It made some significant changes, but was only partially implemented because in 2008, we had the recession and funding was not available to fully implement the uh, improvements BEP 2.0 had intended. And so we kind of languished, uh, halfway implementing BEP 2.0 from 2007 to 2016. And the Enhancement Act of 2016 uh, really kind of wrapped up some of the loose ends from BEP 2.0. It addressed uh, fiscal capacity, which we'll talk about a little bit. It, uh, it uh, called for the end of the cost differential factor. Uh, it addressed the problem of early graduates and it defined at-risk students. So those were the major changes in 2016 and we're, that's, that's the most recent revamping of the formula uh, that we're currently working with today. So that's just a little bit of, of where we've been. As you can see, it's not, there's not a major overhaul very often. Uh, 1992, it was created, 2007 was BEP 2.0 and then 2016. So, um, it, it's, uh, it's basically been intact since uh, 1992. So the formula basically has two separate parts. Uh, the first part I kind of refer to as the funding part. And in the first part of the formula, uh, 
the total amount of funding under this basic education program for each district is determined. The second part is the equalization part or the, the part where it is determined how much of that total amount the state's going to pay and how much that uh, Cannon County uh, Commission will have to pay, the local, the local piece. And that determination is based on uh, fiscal capacity, which really is simply the ability of your local government to raise taxes for education. Uh, typically property tax, sales tax, and in some cases, a wheel tax. Those are the three, the three major uh, funding vehicles that a local government has uh, the ability to use for education. And so we use two fiscal capacity measures, one from uh, UT Knoxville, uh, their Center for Business and Economic Research, and one from a state agency, uh, the Tennessee uh, Advisory Council on Intergovernmental Relations, or TASER. And so we use both of those measures, uh, we use an average of those two measures to determine each uh, county's fiscal capacity or each county's ability to raise taxes. So let's look first at, at how we generate the total amount of funding that each district um, earns through this formula. And there are just a, a few really basic uh, components or basic inputs into this formula. Um, one is the unit costs for salaries and benefits for all of the positions that are involved in a district. Uh, there are also unit costs for supplies, materials, textbooks, uh, maintenance, construction, all those other non-instructional pieces. Um, we look at uh, the cost differential factor, which is not uh, applicable to Cannon County, uh, but we'll, we'll touch on that briefly. And the major input into the formula is your average daily membership which is really your enrollment. And so I can't stress enough how important it is to accurately account for your students, uh, make sure that they are entered into your, uh, your student information system, that your student information system is communicating correctly with the system at the state, known as EIS, and that this is regularly checked to make sure that those student counts or the student numbers are correct. Because as, you, as we go through this, uh, looking at the formula, you'll see that almost everything is based one way or another on your student counts. Now in the instructional component, you're going to find all of your licensed positions that are involved with instruction. So it's your teachers, principals, supervisors, um, uh, counselors, uh, special ed personnel, CTE personnel, um, you know, music art, anyone, anyone with a license. Uh, there's an instructional benefits component and that uh, generates funding for the benefits associated with all of those positions, uh, medical insurance, social security, Medicare, and retirement contributions. The classroom component is other items or people that are found in classrooms but are not licensed. So this would be your educational assistance, um, uh, things like textbooks, materials, supplies, substitute teachers, uh, technology, all those things. And then finally, the non-classroom component is uh, basically maintenance, operations, transportation, capital outlay, uh, really kind of your operational areas. So those are the four main sections of the BEP. Um, the first one is that we're going to look at is the instructional component. And that's, that's where the bulk of the uh, positions and the bulk of the funding is generated. Now, when we look at your student numbers, your average daily membership, we look at uh, funding months two, three, six, and seven. And not to get too deep in the weeds, but when we talk about a funding month, that is 20 instructional days. It doesn't necessarily correlate to a calendar month. So if you started school on August 5th, 
August 5th would be day one of month one and the first 20 days of instruction following August 5th would be month one, then the next 20 are month two and so on. And so we use the second, third, sixth and seventh month and they're weighted, they're weighted more heavily towards the end of the year. Um, and those, that weighted average of those four months is really what determines the vast majority of positions. Now, several of you asked about what we call school-based positions. There are, uh, there are five positions that are funded based on just the number of schools that you have and the size of those schools. And those would be a principal, an assistant principal, librarian, library assistant, and school secretaries. So those are based on, uh, as I said, a school, uh, they're, they're called school-based and they're based on, the, uh, we look at each school in your, uh, in your district to determine how many of these positions you earn. All of the other positions, all the other, all teachers, uh, counselors, uh, supervisors, all of those are based on the average daily membership. So it's just those five uh, that are based on, on schools. What the formula does is it takes all of your students together and breaks them down into uh, grade spans. So for example, um, this, is, this is Cannon County's uh, current fiscal year funding sheet. And so you're being funded for 619 K-3 students. We group all of them together. It doesn't matter how many schools you have, how many, how many of these students are in each school for looking at these types of positions. So we take all of those K-3 students, divide them by 20. And so for every 20 students, one teacher is earned, one regular education teacher is earned. And so this year, Cannon County is earning 30.96 regular education K-3 teachers. How they are divided among your various schools is a local decision. And so changing the number of schools or the size of schools is not going to affect any of these positions that you see listed in this section. Uh, regard, if you had one school with 619 K-3 students or if you had six schools with a total of 619 students, you would generate the same number of teachers. We do the same thing with the other grade spans, four through six, seven through nine, and 10 through 12. And then we look at career and technical students. Um, they have lower class size requirements, and so more teachers are generated by career and technical students. Um, special education students, uh, we generate teachers for them based on uh, the nature of their disability the, or the options uh, of service. And that's basically how much, uh, how, how much time they are outside of the classroom receiving other services like OT or PT or speech or uh, separate classes uh, if, if they're pulled out for math or reading or those types of things. And so we look at, we also look at English uh, language learners uh, and generate teachers for them, art, music, uh, and so on, librarians, uh, I'm sorry, librarians are school-based, um, counselors. Uh, so you can see that all of these are taking numbers of students, dividing them by some ratio, and generating positions. Um, sorry. We then total up the, the total number of positions and multiply that total number of positions by uh, the BEP unit cost for a teacher, which this year is $48,330. And that for Cannon County, the total instructional salaries or in total instructional position funding comes to $6,081,976. Now that is, that's the amount that is later on in the formula gonna be split between what the state pays, and then how much your local government has to pay. Any questions on this so far, on, on this, this deciding how many positions are being earned? 
Any questions, board members? Okay, the chairman would like to uh, go ahead and ask your question, Jay. Yeah, go ahead. About bringing up the principles. Uh, I think we've had several questions about if we were to consolidate in whatever plan or restructure okay. uh, about whether we would gain principles or, or not gain principles. Okay, great question. Principles are, are allocated generally one per school. There is an exception, a school less than 225 students would only earn a half of a principal position and a school with less than 100 students does not earn a principal position at all. So if, if, you have, if all of your schools are at least 225 students, then each school earns one principal. It does not matter the grade levels in that school or the number of students. It's if there is a school with at least 225 students, it earns one principal. So if we rezone and move kids around, each and, and have 225 per school, then each school would be funded for that principal position, correct? Mary Ann, did you hear the question? I, I think if, if each school, I, I think what I heard was if each school has at least 225, each school is funded for a principal and that, that would be true. Now, now the, the, the funding for a principal is the same as a, a funding for all the other instructional positions. So the total funding for the salary is 48,330. And then that's again, split between state and local. Okay. And so if we have three schools and they're all below 225, we got one at 122, another one at 139, and one at 135. Then you're telling me that uh, we're only getting half of that from the state. That is correct. The other half is having to be done by local sources. That is correct. All right, thank you. So the guy on the can and thing that's been talking about that is correct, correct? That he's correct. If we get over 225, then you're fully funding a principal position. Yeah. Or he loses that argument. Okay, thank you, Marianne. I think we're any other questions of board members? All right, thank you, Marianne. Go ahead. Okay, great, great question. Um, I'm going to briefly mention this cost differential here that you see on this salary page. Um, a cost, the cost differential factor gives a little bit of extra funding to school districts that are located in higher cost of living areas. Uh, for example, Williamson County. Uh, Metro Nashville, Shelby County, um, those are the three biggest areas. Uh, they get a little bit of extra funding in recognition of the fact that they have to pay higher salaries so that their employees can afford to live and work in those higher rated areas. This does not apply, there's, um, does not apply to, uh, to Cannon County. It really only applies to 14 to districts total in the state and it is being phased out. And what that will do is the money that's currently going to these, these higher cost districts will be available then to be spread over all of the remaining districts. So it should be a little bit of a boost to everybody else, a little bit of a loss to those 14 districts. Uh, there's no date set for the phase out. So right now we're funding only 16% of the total cost differential. So it's, it's been greatly decreased over the past few years. Um, but this is where it, it's uh, circled in blue here. This is where you would see it. Um, yours is 100% because you don't get anything extra. Uh, in the benefits section, um, we do provide for Social Security, uh, Medicare, and retirement. And also for every position that is funded, uh, we provide insurance uh, 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 based on the uh, state uh, education insurance plan. Uh, and so uh, currently we're fun we fund uh, what comes out to be 45% of the uh, average state premium. So every position that is um, earned in the BEP brings along with it all of the benefits and medical insurance, whether or not the, you know, your teachers take the medical insurance, whether or not you're in the state plan, everyone is funded the same. Everyone is funded as if they were in the state plan. 
So just wanted to, to clarify, people don't always uh, realize that we are providing insurance funding for every position, regardless of, of whether or not it's, uh, it's taken by the employee. Uh, in the classroom section, there are some uh, additional personnel positions, um, nurses, instructional assistants, uh, special ed assistants. Um, and these are, uh, again, these are based on, on your ADM. So again, the importance of accurate uh, student counts. Uh, nurses, uh, currently we're funding one nurse for every 3,000 students with a minimum of one nurse per district. And so uh, in Cannon County, you are earning the one, uh, the one nurse because your total ADM is below the 3,000. Um, again, we provide uh, benefits and insurance for these positions, uh, for the nursing position, as well as for the uh, in instructional and uh, uh, library assistants. So we're providing both salary dollars and all of the benefit dollars uh, for those positions. Uh, Mary Ann, we do, I do two other nurses in our system. Both of them are LPNs. And so all of that would be locally funded then, correct? That is correct, yes, yes. And the, the, the funding of nurses is something that the BEP Review Committee uh, has recommended uh, again this year that be uh, reviewed by the legislature during the budget process uh, to perhaps change that ratio so that, it, so that districts would earn more nursing positions. Um, just, it, I think the, the pandemic and uh, all of the, the health issues related to that have, have moved that to the forefront. Uh, so that was a recommendation this year. The general, only, the only, only people that can change that is the General Assembly, correct? That, yes, that's correct. I, I do want to, um, and I apologize, I do want to mention something that I should have mentioned when we were talking about the teaching positions. Every district in the state of Tennessee employs more teachers than the BEP funds. So it is not, it is very common. And again, every district has more teachers than the BEP funds. And that's primarily because when we fund your, your teachers, we're taking all of your K-3 students in one group. Your, all of your K-3 students are not in one school. They are spread out over some number of schools. And so they don't, they also don't spread in neat bundles of 20. <laughs> and so you, you have to have more teachers in order to accommodate your schools and your demographics, you know, that are in your schools. Um, and again, there are some districts who make a, a conscious choice to have fewer than 20 students in their K-3 classes. There are some districts who want that number set at 15. Well, then they would, again, have even more additional teachers in the BEP funds. So um, th this is definitely not a staffing plan because your, the makeup of your district uh, is, is different from all the makeup of every other district and certainly different than this formula, which really looks at it as if all your students were in one school. And that's clearly not the case. Even one school districts have more teachers than the formula generates. So um, I just wanted to point that out that there's often a misconception that you have, quote, too many teachers if you have more than what the BEP shows. That is not true. Everybody has more and, and for valid reasons. So just wanted to clarify that as you go into budget and budget discussions. Um, also in the classroom section, besides some additional personnel, we find unit costs for things like equipment, uh, substitute teachers, textbooks, um, alternative schools. And these costs are, are based on um, your actual expenditures uh, over the last three years. We take a three-year running average of actual costs um, reported to us by all of the districts and we use what your actual spending across the state to determine these unit costs. So 
um, again, accurate reporting from districts is very important to us because we're taking the numbers that you provide to us in your annual reporting and we're using them to, to create these unit costs. Um, you see them on, uh, these are all in the how-to sheet section of your um, allocation and how-to sheets that, um, that we send out to the districts uh, every year. Um, At-risk students, uh, let's talk about them for a minute. That uh, uh, can be a hot topic. At-risk um, is typically e or primarily economically disadvantaged students. We used to use free and reduced lunch eligibility to determine how many at-risk students you had, but when uh, U.S. Uh, DA changed um, their program somewhat and instituted the community eligibility program where uh, schools with a certain level of uh, poverty could feed all of the students uh, free without having to fill out forms or apply for it. That kind of changed the game because we no longer had free and reduced lunch applications to use to make that determination. And so in 2017, we changed to um, defining at risk as those students who um, are directly certified for benefits like SNAP, TANF, and WIC, and also students who are homeless, migrant, runaways, or foster children. And so that is the, the new definition in the BEP, at any rate, for at-risk students. Each at-risk student earns $940 additional funding uh, just in recognition of the fact that these students have additional needs and need uh, additional services, additional attention, uh, and, and the, this is designed to provide the funding for that. So again, the count of those students is critical. We take that count as of October 1 each year, and it, it's important that those numbers are, are correctly entered into the system again so that we're picking up the correct number and, and giving you the funding that you, you, are, you should be receiving. Um, so I, I point that out, that's often a topic uh, around budget time as well. And then you see here other unit costs um, that are multiplied by the number of your students. So substitute teachers for every, uh, every one of your students, the average daily membership number, um, $68 is provided for substitute teachers. Um, same thing with alternative schools, textbooks, classroom materials and supplies. Uh, we look at the numbers of students in, in various categories and apply these unit costs to them. And that generates funding for all these materials and supplies, travel, uh, substitute teachers, textbooks, all those things that you find in the, in the classroom. Um, this is just some additional uh, uh, unit costs here, exit exams, ACT, uh, career and technical uh, exams, um, and technology. Uh, technology uh, in, for this current fiscal year, each student uh, is allotted $40.96 for technology through the BEP. Um, again, to reiterate that this is not a spending formula, uh, it's a funding formula. These dollars that are generated in, in this classroom section for things like technology and substitute teachers and textbooks don't have to be used for those things. As a board of education and, and a director of schools, you have the ability to use them in any of those classroom areas or any of the instructional position areas. So um, we, you know, we don't require that you spend $40.96 per student on technology. That, that's funding, that's how it's, it's generated or earned, but how you spend it is again a local decision. So I just want to kind of want to come back to that because they're um, often different, different people will view this and say, oh, well, you know, you, you've got you know, X number of dollars per student for technology, well, it, you don't have to spend it that way. And so um, 
the, the local decision making piece becomes very important. Um, moving to the, the final, the non classroom uh, area of the formula, uh, personnel there are your superintendent uh, and the technology coordinator uh, position. So those two positions are um, in the non classroom section. I always think it's interesting that the superintendent is not is in the non classroom area. I think of the superintendent as the instructional leader of the district and uh, and yet the position falls in the non classroom area, but I didn't create the formula. So uh, that's just how it is. Um, again, we provide a salary and benefits for the uh, superintendent and for the uh, technology position. Um, this is also where we find uh, what we call system secretarial support. Uh, and that would be your central office, administrative personnel, um, and your school secretaries. Um, and again, they are allocated salaries and benefits. Every position earns benefits. So um, e even your, your non-teaching positions earn, earn benefits and insurance. Um, we determine the number of custodial positions based on a square footage calculation, and this is not your square footage. Uh, we use uh, a, a um, I don't know what I want to say, a standard number of square feet per student to determine the square footage for each district that we will we will fund. And so it doesn't matter if you have one school or ten schools or what the square footage of those buildings are, every, every district's square footage is calculated the same way. Uh, I think we use like 100 square feet per K, uh, K6 student, a uh, little bit more, 125 maybe for middle school and 135 I think for high school students. So um, it's, it's not, this is not dependent or reflective of what your actual square footage looks like it's, it's just a, an average calculation across the state. Uh, but we do, so it, using those numbers, we have calculated 9.6 custodial positions for Cannon County, and then they're funded again with salaries and benefits. Any questions on any of those positions? Any questions, board members, on those? non-classroom positions okay. no questions Marianne Thank okay you. moving on thanks um, in the non-classroom uh, uh, section of the BEP we have some uh, other allocations for non-instructional equipment and this would be um, uh, administrative equipment or um, uh, what am I trying to say um, you know, equipment used by like in your finance department or your HR department or your maintenance department. Um, pupil transportation is in this non-classroom section and there were some questions on transportation I, I know from, from some of you. The transportation calculation is actually a fairly complex multiple regression that looks at a number of things. Um, I, I couldn't do the formula for you on paper. Uh, I have to rely on, on my computer for that piece, but it, um, it looks at what, um, what your district spends on transportation. And again, when you look at a three year running average of your total transportation expenditures, uh, we look at the number of students that you transport. We look at the number of special ed students that are transported. We look at the number of miles that your buses travel. And we look at the overall enrollment of the district and all those things are wrapped up into this regression formula that then determines the transportation funding for each, each district. And so um, transportation funding for Cannon County for this year, the, the total before we split it up between state and local, it was 758,000. Um, there were some questions about um, the, the distance traveled. Uh, state law 
will not allow us to have a child on a bus longer than one and a half hours in either the morning or the afternoon. Um, and so the, there is no, uh, there's no state regulation about time on the bus and how many students can be on the bus, but there may be some logistical issues. If you've got a bus that's traveling a great distance into rural areas to pick up, you know, a few students here and there, it may not be able to fill up the bus and, and stay within that hour and a half limitation for the students. Um, you know, a bus that, that's running through a more urban or a more densely populated area can pick up fewer students more quickly and get them to school. And so th that may be where, where you have some buses that aren't quite full. But, but it's an hour and a half is the, is the maximum amount of time that a student may be on a bus. <laughs> Any other questions on transportation while we're here? We, we do only also fund only um, students that live more than one and a half miles from school. So many that, so. many districts transport all of their students um, because as I pointed out, the bus is going to go by their, if they live that close to school, the bus is going to run by their house on its way to the school. And so most districts transport all of those students, but you're only funded for those that live more than a mile and a half. Okay, so it, uh, if they're closer than a mile and a half and we pick those up, we are not funded for those students, correct, Mary Ann? That is correct. That is correct. Okay, so at Woodbury Grammar, you know, you know, there are a lot of students we're not funding for because we pick those up that are close to Woodbury Grammar. And the same, same at any of our schools. If you're a mile and a half close to that school, then you're not, we're not funded for that particular pupil. And a mile and a half is a crow and a mile and a half from school to the house. Okay, did you hear the question, Mary Ann? It's a mile and a half school to the house. Right, so it's a mile and a half on the on the actual road. On, on the road. Okay. Yeah. Now, and I, I think the consideration there is that the bus is already on the road with a driver and fuel right. passing those kids, and so. Okay, okay, you know, I, 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 it would be hard to you you know you'd have to think about it some I think to figure out what the additional cost is. You know, if you if you didn't pick them up, w would you really be saving anything? I, and I I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Any other questions, board members? Okay. Okay, Marianne, we're good. We're good on okay. transportation. Okay. Um, not seeing any more questions. Okay. We we all we fund maintenance and operations again on the basis of that calculated square footage of your district, and so maintenance and operations is funded at $3.65 per square foot. And from that comes your, your maintenance and operations personnel, um, and then any other associated costs for, you know, parts or equipment, or, you know, if they have vehicles and anything like that. The reason we do it this way is that because districts handle maintenance and operations very differently from one another, from, you know, each other. Some of you, uh, some districts contract both, some, hire their own employees for both and some do a combination. And so uh, in recognition of that, we, the, the formula just says, okay, X number of dollars per square foot, and then you each district can handle it as, as they see fit. Um, capital outlay uh, is another interesting part um, of the formula. Uh, we do fund capital outlay. It's in the non-classroom section which means that those funds that are earned there can be used for anything. They can be used for teacher salaries, they can be used for health insurance, they can be used for textbooks, or they can be used for capital outlay, but there's no requirement that they be used for capital outlay. And that is sometimes why I think some, there is some a misconception that, that capital outlay is not funded. But again, we look at, we look at this square footage, the, this average square footage for your district, and then we look at the cost of construction, what it would cost to, to construct um, 
uh, an elementary, a middle, and a high school based on the number of students that you have and the, the square footage that each of those um, generates. And we, we look at what the total cost of construction would be, including financing it over uh, 20 years uh, at, I believe it's a 6% interest rate and amortizing that loan over, um, or not, but looking at a life expectancy of the building of 40 years. And so uh, for Cannon County, every year we're generating about $1.5 million for capital outlay based on con current construction costs for elementary, middle, and high school buildings. Uh, again, feeding off the numbers of students you have in each of those grades, grade levels. Okay, any questions now? So that we, we total up all those individual pieces of, of, of funding that, that have been earned through this formula. And now we're to the part where we're going to decide how much is the state gonna pay and how much is, is the local funding body going to have to pay? So any more questions on how we generate this before we look into how we divide it out? Any questions? We could always come back to. Okay, now going back to the square footage, uh, Marianne, on that, yep. that is just a calculated figure based upon the number of students that you have, correct? That's correct. The number of students and the grade level that they are in. Okay. Yep. All right, Marianne, uh, on, the, on the cost per square footage, uh, the square footage cost there. Uh -huh. Is, is that just an estimate? That's an estimation on from the state itself, correct? That those the, the cost per square foot is actually based on a publication uh, called RS Means. And RS Means annually compiles construction costs for just about every type of building you can think of. Um, and we we have used that uh, for as long as I've been involved with the BEP. Uh, we've used their their construction costs. Uh, an average of the three, it's a three, again, a three year running average of their construction costs. And then we inflate it up to, to current year. So that is based on, on research done by RS means. They're right. kind of the industry standard. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? You're welcome. Okay. okay, no other questions, Marianne. All right, well, let's, let's see how we decide who pays how much. Um, as I said before, fiscal capacity is, is the term we use to, uh, to talk about the ability of a, of a county to raise local taxes for education. It's not based on what any county actually raises. It's, it's based, again, on average property and sales tax rates across the state of Tennessee, and it, it applies those average rates to your property and sales tax base and decides and then determines what, what share um, Cannon County would be able to, to pay. Again, based on these averages, we're not looking at what, what anybody actually does. Some districts raise more, some raise less, um, but this is based on, on averages and calculations. Um, the, the, the model out of UT Knoxville is the, is the simplest. Uh, it looks only at property and sales tax bases and applies the state averages, uh, average tax rates to it, um, and then determines the, the ratio of, of what Cannon County can raise compared to the rest of the state. Um, and so this is just, we, we don't need to, I don't think we need to get into the weeds of the calculation. This is here if anybody's desperate to, to look at the, uh, the math. Um, the TASSER fiscal capacity is more complex. Uh, it is the older of the two models, um, but it looks at per pupil revenue. It looks like, uh, it looks at property assessments, uh, sales tax base, per capita income. That's the big difference. Um, and then it looks at uh, the tax burden and the service burden per capita. The, in, in general, the TASSER model is more favorable towards smaller, more rural counties 
And in general, the CBER model is more favorable for larger, more urban districts. That is not true in every case, but for the vast majority of districts that would hold true. So a small rural county would, would benefit if we only use the TASR model and a large urban district like Metro Nashville would benefit if we used only the UT model. In recognition of that, we use an average of the two. Um, totally phasing one or the other out at this point would cause quite an upheaval in, in funding and would there would likely have to be some adjustments made to ease the, the transition. And so in 2017, uh, the legislature formally put into law that we use an average of these two, um, uh, these two uh, uh, fiscal capacity indices. So the TASR model and the CBER model, we basically, we add them together, you know, we, we take half of them, take 50% of each one, and then add those two together. And so um, this is, I believe this is, this is your fiscal capacity. Um, it says volunteer county, but I believe this is Cannon, this is Cannon counties, I'm sorry. I, did, I changed it one place, but not somewhere else. Um, your TASR model is 0 0.08. Your CBER model is 1.109. The lower the fiscal capacity, the more state money you get. So the lower your, your, you know, your local ability to raise money is, the more money the state will give you. So you can see here that you, you would benefit if only TASR was used because the TASR index is lower than the CBER. So you are a county that fits the generalization of the model. Um, but instead of using one or the other, we're using the average of 0 0.095. And so it, we, we apply that number um, to a formula where we look at the total statewide instructional funding, your fiscal capacity, and then we say that on average, the locals pay 30%. Um, that's an average you, you actually contribute. Let, you, you know, you are, Cannon County pays less than 30% because you have such a low fiscal capacity. Um, but this is uh, for your instructional funding for this year. Uh, a state, the state average is 30%. Cannon County is responsible for 15%. And then the state pays the balance almost 85%. So your total instructional funding uh, of the total funding that the formula uh, calculates for Cannon County, the state's going to put in right at 85% and Cannon County is going to put in 15%. And we do that for all of the other um, categories in the BEP. We do it for instructional uh, benefits, we do it for classroom, and we do it for non-classroom. And if you look on the cover sheet of the allocation sheet that you receive every, every year, um, you can see where uh, up here in instructional funding, it, this is the total funding is eight million. Or I'm sorry, six million eighty-two thousand. The local share is fifteen percent, or nine hundred fourteen thousand, and the state share is five million one hundred sixty-eight thousand. And so, that's reflected again uh, in instructional benefits for classroom funding. This the local share is eleven point nine two percent versus a state average of 25%. And then in the non-classroom funding, the local, your local share is 22.25% versus a statewide average of 50%. So your, your, your local contribution is roughly half of what the state average is. And that's, that's based on your, your local fiscal capacity. So any, any questions on, on that? Um, there, there's not much you can do to affect your, your fiscal capacity, you know, to be proactive about it. Um, it's more a reflection of things that happen. If a, if a new industry comes to your county, that could raise your fiscal capacity, uh, which means you would be... Uh, hey, Ty. 
able to to contribute more, uh, which may result Before in a I lower forget, state share. Grandma says she found somebody to do your knife. So tomorrow, when you go back to take get the ham and biscuits, um, take your knife. Or s states Sorry. can. Sorry about that, Marianne. That's okay. Um, or uh, uh, an industry could uh, could leave your your community, or uh, a store could close, and that could cause your fiscal capacity to be lowered because you have a smaller sales tax or, or real estate tax base. So those are those are basically the kinds of things that 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 affect that. It, it's changes in the economy uh, versus things that you can do to affect your your fiscal capacity. Any questions? Just wanted to point out a couple of things that are on that allocation sheet. Um, if I think you, I think you have copies of it. Uh, if not, I'll, I can. I'll, I'll be sh there in my slides. But um, again, this is the this is the allocation sheet where uh, we break down for you what the state is going to pay, and so you see what the state will pay on the instructional category, instructional benefits, classroom and non-classroom. And so in, in this current fiscal year, the state is providing $12,115,000 to Cannon County. Okay, uh, we have a question, uh, Mary Ann, from Commissioner Ronnie Mahaffey who's in, mm -hmm. our, in our meeting. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Mahaffey. Uh, Mary Ann, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier that basically property tax and sales tax was the basic fiscal tax that the county not concur with that, but you also mentioned such things as major wheel tax. If, if our wheel tax drops down in the future, which it is a part of it is set to sunset, uh, would that wheel tax be lowered uh, have an impact as far as lowering our fiscal capacity? I don't believe so. It, it, it would not affect the uh, UT Seber calculation uh, because that only looks at property and sales tax, and I don't think TASR looks at wheel tax. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. You're welcome. Um, there is a, uh, a provision in the funding laws talking about minimum funding. Uh, this does not affect Cannon County at the current time, and that's, uh, that's really a good thing because typically this uh, is – this comes into play if a district is typically losing students and losing funding. Uh, and that has not been the case, but that combination of, of uh, events has not occurred uh, recently in Cannon County. If it were to occur, there is a, a, a baseline, if you will, below which your funding would not fall. And that's what minimum funding is. We, we calculate every year what every district's minimum funding is to be sure that they don't drop below that. And it's really it's based on um, your fiscal year 16 BEP allocation, plus all of the increases in salaries and benefits that have occurred since then. And so we take that into account. Um, and so we look we look back to fiscal year 16 uh, and make sure that 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 that's our basis for um, giving you ba basically a floor below which your funding won't fall. If that were to occur, you would see it listed very prominently on your allocation sheet, but that does not, uh, that does not affect Cannon County. And like I said, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and so you, you won't see that. Also on that allocation sheet is the required local match. And that's, a, that's an important piece of the formula. I said earlier that education funding is a shared or a joint responsibility in Tennessee this is where we see that this come into play. Um, the state is contributing, as I said, $12,115,000. And this year, Cannon County is required to contribute a minimum of $2,448,000. And so you see that on the, on the allocation sheet on the line marked total required local matching funds. Off to the right of that, it, we had listed what the local contribution was in fiscal year 20. Um, and we, that's really an informational piece. What we want to do is point out if your, if your new required matching funds is higher than the previous year's allocation, that means that your funding body is going to have to contribute more money to, to meet that required local match. And so we put that out there 
just as an informational piece and as kind of an alert uh, to see if you are getting close to that amount uh, where you might have to have some conversations with your funding body uh, to make sure that uh, you are meeting the, the minimum. There, there's also another piece, um, another requirement for the local funding body uh, called maintenance of effort that we'll talk about later. Um, and so both required local match and maintenance of effort have to be met every year. But the, the required local match uh, comes directly out of the BEP formula and we put it on the uh, allocation sheet so that you have that number handy. We also show you um, uh, uh, ADM information. Uh, we show you uh, what you're being funded on uh, for, for this current fiscal year, which is uh, 1,917 total students uh, versus the prior year of 1,881. Uh, we also look at the career and technical students and look at, at how many uh, are being funded this year versus last year. And the same thing with special education students. That helps you see if there's a trend or if there's a change in your funding, you can kind of quickly see is it, would it be perhaps based on a change in your student demographics. Um, we also look at weighted average salary on this allocation sheet. Um, and we, we look to compare every district's weighted average salary to the statewide weighted average salary. Um, we, the BEP Review Committee looks at that to see uh, how, this, how salary disparity is across the state. Are, are the higher paid districts uh, getting further and further away from the lower paying districts or are the, is that gap closing? Um, we also use it to, um, to determine if your new instructional funds, instructional salary funds can be used on just salaries or if they can also be used on benefits. If your weighted average salary is uh, less than the state's, you can only use your new instructional salary money for instructional salaries. If your weighted average is higher than the state's average, then you can use your new instructional funds for either benefits or salaries. Um, your, your, your weighted average salary is lower than the state's, so if there had been a new salary money this year, you would have had to use it on salaries. Unfortunately, uh, due to the economic crisis caused by the pandemic, uh, there was no uh, instructional salary increase this year. So um, that's kind of a moot point. But I point that out because in for the past eight or nine years, there has been a dollar figure there every year. And we certainly hope to see that come back in the future. And so that kind of, um, Th this tells you how, what you're going to have to do with those new dollars. So in your case, you would likely, uh, if there's an increase next year, you would likely have to use that on only instructional salaries. You couldn't use any of it for benefits. Um, okay. Um, we also list on here the individual education account amount. Individual education account program uh, is for certain special education uh, disabilities. Parents may choose to remove their uh, special needs child from the public education system. Uh, they give up many of their uh, rights that would otherwise be theirs uh, through public education, uh, but they take with them their, uh, their uh, state and, and required local BEP funding, and then they can use that money to provide uh, an education elsewhere for their special needs child. Um, and so Cannon County's amount uh, for this year is $7,596. So if you have any students who have withdrawn from Cannon County and are in the IEA program, at the end of the year, we will, we will reduce your final BEP payment by the $7,500 for every student who was partaking in the program. Um, that's just a shift of, of money. Uh, you're not educating the student. The student is included in your count for funding. And so then the funds are shifted to the, to the parent to provide that education. Um, the, that allocation sheet, that cover page really also has your fiscal capacity indices on it. If we show you the TASR, the FOX, and then we show you the, the average. 
Hey, Mary Ann, we have a question from the chairman. Okay, great. It was about talking about the ADMs, and uh, I know this is speculation, but uh, there are many, many districts, including our own, who've asked for hold harmless because of COVID. Um, have you heard any speculation on your end in Nashville of whether the legislature will accept those recommendations from many, many school districts in Tennessee? That certainly has been a topic uh, of conversation. I know TOSS is uh, advocating for that. The BEP Review Committee in their annual report advocated for a hold harmless. It was number one on their list of recommendations. Um, I've heard a number of legislators talking about it. So I, I, I'm confident that it will be discussed. Um, not sure what form it would take, uh, but I, I think there's, um, I think there's a, a probably a fairly good likelihood that something it, it will certainly be discussed. I I'm not in a position to speak for the legislature by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I, I guarantee you it's going to be discussed. Um, and that's something if you have a legislative uh, a, a relationship with your legislators, I certainly would reach out to them and continue to do so and continue to work with TOSS and um, TSBA as well. Right, and I, I think it's a concerted effort. And I, I've all, we've already spoken, Mr. Pody, our state senator, as well as our, as Clark Boyd, uh, who's our state representative. And I've had other conversations with members of the uh, of the House Education uh, Committee, and I, that that's going to be number. They say it's, it's going to be number one on the runway. Is what I've been told. But we'll yeah. see if it's number one or not. But maybe it's yeah. number two or three instead of number one. Or not. And. You know, as I think as long as it gets discussed, if it's not number one, if it still gets discussed, uh, that's going to be a good thing. Um, uh, the, the chairman also asked, uh, would that affect local contribution um, in, in regard to that? Is uh, what, what is your take on that? Would that rate, let's say we went down 100 students and uh, the legislature hold harmless, uh, would, that, uh, would that calculate in the local contribution? Could the local contribution go down? That hasn't been decided. That that is being that's one of the one of the things that we'll have to take a, a, hard, a hard look at as we as we talk about a hold harmless. What effect, uh, if any, there would be on the local contribution? Uh, I I can't say right now, but I I do know that it has that has been flagged as something that needs to be looked at for sure, and and hammered out before the before any legislation is passed, so that everybody's in agreement on how that will be handled. Okay, so that, that, that was probably the aching question among the, among the body tonight. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from board members? Okay, all right, thank you, Mary Ann, continue. Okay, all right, just a couple other, a couple things I, I just wanted to, to mention, um, kind of related topics and things that you may hear of when, when we talk about BEP, um, which is an ever popular topic, obviously. Um, growth funding. Uh, this is funding, additional funding that is available for districts that see an increase in their enrollment um, versus what you're being funded on. So you're being funded right now on about 1,900 students. If you were to take account uh, as we go through this year and you discover that you had 2,000 students, then uh, there would be some additional funding available uh, to help cover the additional costs that you're incurring because you have significantly more students than you than you are currently being funded for. Um, we are required to fund growth over 2%. Historically, we've funded uh, almost all growth. Um, I do not know how it's going to look this year. Uh, many districts enrollment is down um, because of, of the pandemic and parents doing different things with their students and homeschool and um, all kinds of issues. So we're, I, I don't know what the growth picture is going to look like this year. I, I don't expect there to be as much growth as there has been in the past, but uh, I could be surprised. Um, the state minimum salary schedule. Um, annually, the state board of education approves a minimum salary schedule. Um, the Currently, the minimum that's required to be paid for a teacher with a bachelor's degree and no years of experience is $36,000. Uh, there was no change for this current year, uh, again, based on the economic uh, uh, issues caused by the pandemic and, and vast uncertainty about uh, the economy going forward, 
into fiscal year 21 and beyond. Um, uh, I do I do point this out though as this as the state minimum salary schedule is increased uh, as it is frequently, um, then you need you would need to be looking at your own current salary schedule to see if you needed to make any adjustments. So for example, if if your bachelor's in zero salary is thirty six thousand and we raised it to thirty six five, then you would have to raise your salary schedule and that is that is very much impactful on your budget. Um, the one, one issue that is difficult is that the state board generally doesn't make that final determination until May, uh, after many of you have, have put your budgets together. And so we, we try to work with them and we try to see if we can get a sense of what is going to happen so that we can communicate that to districts as you're preparing your budgets earlier, like in March and April. <laughs> um, but that's this is sometimes dependent on what the legislature does as far as uh, increasing the salary and the BEP formula. And so that doesn't always get uh, finalized until late in the year. Um, when the state minimum salary schedule is, is very much a, a skeleton of what it was uh, prior to, I think, 2014. Uh, and there's no this, the state no longer prescribes an increase to your local salary schedule other than the fact that you must meet the state minimums. But if the, if the salary in the component in the BEP increases by 2%, for example, you do not have to increase your entire salary schedule by 2%, as was the case prior to 2014. And so there are no prescribed across the board increases for certified staff. The new salary dollars that you earn through the BEP are used at the discretion of, of the board and the, and the director of schools. They can be used for you know, steps on your salary schedule. They can be used for an overall improvement to your salary schedule, differentiated pay, bonuses, new positions, um, and any of those things. As long as you're meeting the minimum on the state salary schedule, other increases or improvements to your salary pay plan is at your discretion. Miriam, we had a question. Uh, Chairman uh, Fan, you had a question? Yeah, what is our budget due? Now, we, we, uh, I think it is suggested that our budget is due to the commission on May the 15th. Uh, is, that, is that a state statute, Mary Ann, or uh, where the budget has to be over to the commission by the 15th of May? No, that's probably a local. A local rule. So we had it early this year, so we were we were in pretty good shape this past year. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think this time was the earliest it's been a long time. It ran even in July. Yeah. So we we met the state deadline uh, this year. And that was that was good because the year before we were right down to the wire uh, on the last year, the last time. I know the comptroller's team um, has made a concerted effort to have everybody have their budget in by in and approved by July first, um, and I know he they pushed hard for that this past year. The uh, a concern that I have heard from any number of districts. And I and I understand the concern, and I have I have been on the I have been in a district, so I, I understand both sides. Um, we don't have final BEP numbers for you until July, and so if you have to have your budget to the commission by May fifteenth, you're likely going to use the April BEP estimate, which is the least accurate of the estimates. Um, and that often necessitates later on down the road, perhaps a budget amendment to, um, to budget in the actual BEP amount that you're gonna be receiving from the state uh, if, you, if you need to do that. So um, we have heard from any number of districts that they would, they would like to have the BEP numbers earlier. The problem is that we don't have all the data that we need to run the formula for the final time until after June 15th. And so we're, we're caught 
with with the components that we need, we don't have the information, but at the same time, we know that you all do need the information earlier. So um, just looking ahead to what, what might be a little bit of a, a, a concern in the spring. Um, uh, I don't, there's no easy answer for it, and we certainly don't have one, but uh, just I, I'm just acknowledging that that kind of rub exists, if you will. It, it is, and I think we sent a modified, we did a modified budget. We sent one over on May 15, and then we uh, did a modification of ours mm -hmm. at, in June before yeah. the deadline, before the next deadline. Okay. Yeah. Um, we talked about the required local match. That is the amount that the, for, <clears throat> excuse me, the BEP formula uh, requires locals to uh, contribute. That amount, um, again, is on that is on the allocation sheet, and we provide the comparison for what you're currently contributing, so that you can plan ahead for a an issue. Um, that the test of this is in ePlan, um, and uh, let me see, you can't, this is not visible while the budget is under construction and before it's approved by the state, um, it's not visible to the public, it's visible to ePlan users and to state folks. Um, but the test is in ePlan, ePlan looks at, uh, it pulls out all of the local revenue that you have uh, entered in your budget and it compares it to the required local match and makes sure that what you're budgeting is at least uh, as much as the required local match. And then down in green, it will light up and say that the required local match test is met. On that same page is the maintenance of effort test. And this is, this is the second test, if you will, of local contribution. Maintenance of effort uh, requires that your budgeted local revenue has to be at least equal to what you budgeted in the previous year. And so a, a local funding body cannot reduce their local contribution to education uh, from year to year. ePlan is going to go in and it's going to look at last year's budget in that column to the far right on the, on the slide and it's going to look at what you budgeted last year. It's going to look at what you budgeted this year. And if, if the current year is uh, equal to or greater than last year, then you are good to go. Um, there, there is uh, a circumstance whereby a, a funding body is able to lower its contribution. And that is if your ADM or your yeah, enrollment sir. drops. Yeah, we just had the question. Even if ADM drops, you, you answered that question. If ADM yeah. drops, that's the... If, that's if the ADM answer. drops, then we go to what, what we call a level two test, and we look at local revenue on a per student basis. And so last, you know, the prior year's per student amount has to be equal to, uh, or at, 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 you have to contribute at least on a per student basis what you contributed the prior year. Uh, so that's the only time that uh, maintenance, the, the local contribution can be lowered. It can never be lowered below the required local match in the BEP. So both of those, both of those tests have to be met every year. So that's, it's a dual test. Um, for the vast majority of districts, the, the current contribution is above the required local match. And so local match doesn't enter into it too much, although in uh, those years when we were really increasing um, the BEP amounts by hundreds of millions a year, uh, we did run into a year where we had four or five districts that failed required local match. And that was the first time that had happened in a long time. Um, and so it's one of the reasons we watch for it a little bit more now, because as we continue to increase state funding, the required local matches are increasing and districts that are our funding right around that number um, have to be very cautious that they they keep an eye on that and and meet it. You are you are fairly above your required local match, so not not so much an issue for you. Um, another test that we look at is the fund the three percent fund balance test. Um, every district, um, well, I shouldn't say that most districts have a fund balance. 
And if you are budgeting to spend only what you are budgeting to take in as revenue, in other words, if your revenues and your expenditures are equal, fund balance is not such an issue for, for those districts. But if you are going to budget more than you expect to receive in revenue, and you want to use your fund balance to make up the difference, to balance the budget, then the 3% test comes into play. And what that says is that you can use your fund balance as long as 3% of your operating expenditures stay put in the fund balance. So we look at your operating expenditures, we calculate 3% of that, and that's the amount that has to stay in the fund balance. You can budget the rest of it, but you have to keep at least that 3% in there. Now, 3% is probably the minimum that, that should be on hand. 3% can evaporate pretty quickly in the face of a major incident. I think of Wilson County last year that lost two schools in a tornado. Um, I think of Sevier County and the fires of, what, four years ago. Um, the district I was in lost uh, parts of two buildings to a tornado one spring. And that 3% that can, can go pretty quickly. Um, and so the 3% the uh, you know, becomes important as a buffer for either an unexpected event like a natural disaster or for a sudden drop in, in revenues. Um, like we, we, in some cases last spring, we saw a drop in local revenues because so many businesses were closed for such a long time, especially uh, counties uh, that depend on a lot of sales tax. If those businesses and restaurants were closed or at, at low capacity for a long time, that affected their sales tax. And so the fund balance then is kind of your savings account or your cushion against unforeseen uh, things. I do caution districts always, be careful what you use your fund balance for. If you're gonna pull money out of that reserve and budget it, it is not generally a best practice to, to use those funds for recurring expenditures. The, the fund balance is like a savings account. And if you are using your savings account to pay your mortgage, at some point the savings account is gonna dry up and you're still gonna have the mortgage. And, and then what do you do? Same thing with this. If you're using the three, if you're using your fund balance to pay salaries, there could come a time, and I've seen it happen in other districts, where all of a sudden the fund balance has shrunk. They don't have enough over the 3% that they're required to keep to fund their salaries. And, and then that, that's a real problem because you're either looking at increased contribution from your local funding body or a reduction in your expenditures, um, neither of which are, are particularly easy. And so I, I, do, I do caution you to be uh, thoughtful about uses of the fund balance uh, in, an, in an operating budget. It's perfectly allowable uh, under statute and, and we, would, you know, we would allow your budget to, to go through and be approved, but just know that at some point that, that may come to a a point where it's, it's no longer possible. Uh, E-Plan uh, calculates the 3% fund balance for us. And in your case, uh, in, in this current fiscal year, you're only using 83,000 of your fund balance and you had available to be used uh, two point, almost 2.7 million. So you, you, you did not, uh, certainly did not budget a lot of your fund balance. And so that, uh, that looks like a good practice. Um, one final term that you might hear is mandatory increases. Um, we assure every district that they receive the full value of increases in salary, uh, TCRS contributions, and insurance every year, uh, regardless of whether or not they're on minimum funding, regardless of whether or not they have a decrease in enrollment, everybody gets the full value of, of uh, salary and benefit improvements. Um, and so that becomes part of minimum funding. Uh, so just be assured that you will always receive that. Um, that is generally the end of the, of the presentation. The, the rest of this, I, there's some resources here. Um, ePlan uh, is, is one place where you can go for some information. I've got a couple slides here of who to call for various uh, 
various things. The this uh, first slide here is really what what we used to call the Nashville crew before we all got sent to work from home. Uh, this is the group that used to be in Nashville at uh, TDOE, uh, grants management and uh, payments. Uh, we've got a couple of vacancies that we're working on filling. And then these are your regional finance consultants. And unfortunately, you've lost your consultant. Um, Brian Runyon has left to go to uh, a district. Uh, and we are working to replace, uh, to replace Brian. Uh, I, I would nominate Douglas, uh, Mary Ann, but I don't know if <laughs> Douglas would, uh, would desire to, <laughs> to do that. I'm trying I to talk. I don't see, I I don't see Douglas's lazy. face. <laughs> He's on, and that's why I can kid him on, on that. Uh, no, um, no, Douglas, you cannot go. <laughs> <laughs> Not going anywhere, Douglas. Um, and then finally, She's there's some... for a reason. <laughs> what did you say, Douglas? Unmute there. What did you, what did you say? I said, she is laughing for a reason. <laughs> no, we would be glad to have you, but I don't think Cannon County wants to lose you. <laughs> I said I, I hate to hear Brian. I hate to hear Brian is gone. Brian, Brian has served us well, so uh, uh, I do hate. I do hate that. And we'll have yeah, I we we hated to see him go. I think I think he's. I think it's a good opportunity for him. I think he'll it'll stretch him some, and it's probably good for him in the long run. But uh, Mary, he does hurt to lose wanna, somebody. This this last slide, you may want to check those uh, those things. I don't think the comptroller has very much on the BEP anymore. But the state board, I think that email address, I mean, your uh, HTTP there, I think your URL is uh, is a little dated. I, I tried to click on that and it didn't go there, so. Oh, okay. Maybe if you take out tn.gov slash SBE usually works. Um, okay. Yeah, it did. It did. And it was, okay. you had to go under programs and it had to be. Oh, better. yeah. They, I guess they moved that. Thank yeah, they you. Yeah, they just their website. The comptroller probably has too, but. I noticed yeah. that there used to be a BEP calculator on the comptroller, and I, I don't think it's no longer there the last time I checked. So. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, I would have hoped they would have taken that down or told us. And I have downloaded the BEP Blue Book, which was only eight pages yep. uh, two for the board. And then I also downloaded the, uh, the from 2018, the, calc the BEP calculations manual. Which yes, is 93 pages, Marianne. So, uh, uh, yes, everybody can enjoy that reading. Over. We we call that a sleep aid uh, at the department. If you ever can't sleep, just pull that out and start reading through that. It is an excruciatingly detailed look at every calculation, um, and it, there's an update of that coming soon too. So, yeah, <laughs> if we can, if we can get through that. I understand. Um, I understand. So a remake of that is happening. Under yes, <laughs> that's like a little update. Um, and then our obligatory fraud, waste, or abuse slide. Uh, please report any of the above uh, if you are to see it. So we'll go back to questions. That That is kind of a very quick run through of a very complex formula. So I appreciate your hanging in there with us. Great questions. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, and plus, you can always forward them to me through uh, Douglas or, or uh, Director Curtis. I'm, I'm happy to uh, to address anything at any time. Okay, hang on. We got a couple questions. Uh, Good. Go ahead, uh, what did you say our exact fund balance was? Our exact fund balance, Marianne, did you uh, have that? Um, Yes, I think that was on there. I think that was on that other slide, and I've, I've sent the board these copies of these slides, and I'll I'll send it. I'll afford it yeah. with your PowerPoint to anyone who would like. Okay. That. Yeah. At at the at um at the on July one, the fund balance was three point one million. Okay. And of that, the three percent that you had to hold back was a, just under four hundred sixty thousand, which left you the two point seven million to. Um, to budget if you wish to. Yeah, we did a we did a year into it uh, with this uh, bare bones budget that we had this last time. Yeah. And so these are new board members, and I, I wanted them to give a perspective. And Marianne, I really appreciate you taking your time on a on a snowy Monday night to do. <laughs> I know who would have thought it'd be so snowy too. <laughs> yeah, the it's last crazy. Of November. Okay, I've got another question too. Go ahead, uh, wait. 
because you have to know the average uh, of a teacher over most campuses. How many, what is the average of too many teachers? Yeah, the average of too many teachers. I mean, we get hit a lot of that, that we're over X amount of, that we're 40 teachers over, we're blah, blah, blah. blah. What is the average across the state is, I think, Mr. McMackens' question. I, that I don't know. And it's it's really hard to say because it, it so depends on how many schools people have and the size. Um, I know there, there are a couple of districts in Middle Tennessee that are fairly comparably sized, but one has a lot of small schools and one has fewer very large schools. And so, you know, that makes a difference in the number of teachers that you're over. I, I think a better look would be to see what, what your ratios are. Do you have, um, you know, do you have a, a, a great deal of very small classes? Um, we do, we do, we do. But we in some three. cases that, that can't be helped if you have a small school you know, and, and you still have to meet the, the state, the state averages. Right, the state bare minimums that they, they have. And, yeah. Uh, they're very familiar with the bare minimums. I think this board is, yeah. is, is very familiar with those. I, uh, I think statewide there are, I, I think at, well, a year, a year ago, there were about 9,000 teachers in Tennessee over what the BEP funds. Um, 9,000 statewide. Let me, and let me see what percentage that was. Let me, let me do a rough percentage here. And this is very rough. About 13%. I mean, 13% over, is that what you're saying? Mary? Yeah, sta statewide. 13% over, over what, what is funded. What is funded on the BEP. Okay. You know, and that that is in no way saying that that's too many teachers. I I, I don't think I ever use that those words. Um, I under, understand that. <clears throat> I, I know others often do, but I, certainly we're at the department are not going to be saying that. Um, I understand. Okay. Uh, additional questions, um, uh, Mr. Mullins. The, back to the principal stuff. The two hundred twenty-five students is one principal funded. So from Students from 100 to 225 in between that number, is that a half salary or do you have to go below a certain number to get that half salary? No, between 100 and 225 would be a half a salary. That, that was my question. Okay, great questions. Yes, excellent. Okay, get some talk among board members right now. Any additional questions for, we want to be very cognizant of Mary Ann's time since we started late. Okay, any other questions? What's your opinion on rezoning? Does rezoning gain us any more funds? Should we do it uh, when we get the numbers up? Okay, so will rezone it would rezoning uh, gain us any any additional funding if we were to if the, this board were to rezone would it gain us any other funding uh, at all? Except probably on the principal side, if we had smaller ones, that'd be the only thing I could see. Right, because your 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 funding for the vast majority of positions is going to be based on your overall. A A ADM, average daily membership. And so the zoning does not affect that. It, it would affect these school-based positions. You're, you know, possibly a librarian, the principal, um, you know, if you, if you rezoned and, and the, and the uh, you know, schools increase their enrollment over the 225, uh, then that would, that would bump that could bump them up from a half a principal to a full principal position being funded. Okay, but that would be only on those positions that are a principal, assistant principal. Uh, librarian, library I assistant, and school secretary. Those are the only ones. I've seen that on there, okay. Yeah, no, nothing else would, would change. Great, 1917 is what you're going by. That's that's what we're going by. Right, uh, 
could have a K-12, but 1900 can be. Okay. All right, anything, anything, anything else? Marianne, you've been very patient. I appreciate you very much uh, uh, coming by. I'm I'll delighted Penny, to be here. Uh, uh, Penny is scheduled to be in our district, perhaps. We were looking at uh, December the 10th. If she comes here, I will, uh, I will brag on you, Marianne. You need to bring me the race. <laughs> Oh well, thank you. <laughs> no, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we don't have we don't have any money at the state either, so. <laughs> yeah, y'all are bare bones too. I understand. That. Yeah, we are. <laughs> uh, but we did the we do do the bare minimum on the salary schedule. I, I do want to emphasize on the salary schedule that we we start out at the minimum, and, and that's sad for for us. But yeah, we we do that, and we have our salary steps that have been approved. So. Okay. Okay, anything else before I let Mary Ann go? We stop the broadcast. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. For our five, one of, them had, one of our board members had to leave, but all of the, the four members, uh, Ms. Methalitha Thomas, uh, the chairman, Chairman Fan, and uh, Mr. Uh, Derek Mullins, and also Mr. Wade McMacken send you their best. And uh, thank you for doing this, Mary Ann. Well, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure to, to join you, and um, I wish you all the best in, in the hard work that you do uh, managing managing a school district with all the challenges, especially this year. So hats off to you, and if I can do anything, just let me know. And I apologize for the, uh, the snafu. We'll, we'll oh. do better next time on the technology line. No, no worries. It happens to us all the time. I, we, we live this way, so not a problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mary Ann. Y'all have a good all night. Right. Thank Bye. you again. Good All right, night. this time we'll close, uh, we'll close the broadcast and thank everybody for checking in and hopefully you've learned something, uh, something tonight. Uh, and everybody have a good, a safe evening. Uh, uh, we will make a determination here shortly about determination of closing schools tomorrow, but uh, you heard it here first, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see everybody. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. All right, Mr. Coper, if you're still on, could you uh, make sure this is recorded somewhere? I'm working on it. All right, thank you, sir. And I'll see you in the morning. Uh, we'll look at uh, some some technology changes here. Okay. okay.